New Testament and theology. He holds a theology doctorate from Grace Theological Seminary and is the founding president of Western Reformed Seminary. And as I look around, there are several pastors in this room and elders. Almost every one of the ones that I see here have, was a student of Dr. Battle at some point in our lives and in his life. So Dr. Battle, it's a great privilege to have you come and instruct us tonight. Well, thank you, President Titu. And it's a real pleasure and privilege to be with you tonight. As was said, we have two very brief and simple topics tonight, the Bible and Christ. Now, these comprise chapters four and five of Machen's wonderful book, Christianity and Liberalism. He was dealing primarily with arguments that confronted the Bible-believing church in his day. And many of these arguments began and were developed and promoted from the country of Germany. Now, if you have your uh, handout, uh, I'll be sort of following along that more or less informally, but some of the names I mentioned are in there in case uh, they're sort of hard to, to hear. About 120 years ago, Germany was the host to a young and enthusiastic and talented New Testament scholar, a very promising scholar, young man, uh, Gresham Machen, who stayed there for a year studying at two different universities in Germany. Shortly before that time, Germany had been uh, not a single nation, but a hodgepodge of very small states and cities and separate jurisdictions. And it wasn't until 1871 that that nation was declared to be unified as a single nation. And during those years, there was a tremendous ferment and growth of activity, artistic, intellectual, political, religious, music, art, all these areas thrived during those years as Germany came together to be a, a single people. And if you wanted to go and study somewhere where you have the best scholars and the most recent scholarship and the best resources, uh, very often you would find yourself uh, going to Germany. And that's uh, what the young Machen was doing. Machen himself was born just 10 years after Ger Germany was unified in the year 1881. He went to Johns Hopkins University and studied Greek and Latin and other classic subjects. Then he went to Princeton Theological Seminary and studied theology there under the great B.B. Warfield and, and other wonderful scholars there at Princeton. And because of his great abilities, especially in the languages and in his interest in the New Testament, the faculty encouraged him to further his studies, and then come back and be a teacher. Well, Machen wasn't totally sure he wanted to do that. Uh, he did want to further his studies, but he had some doubts and questions, and he didn't feel called at that time to be ordained as a Presbyterian minister, which Princeton Seminary required for its regular faculty. So he said, well, maybe I'll come back and teach uh, Greek. Or, or Latin, something like that, or maybe go to some other school and do that. But he did want to go to Germany, so he left to go to Germany at the age of 24. He wanted to, among other things, learn the German language fluently because all these books were written in German. And uh, if you wanted to be a scholar, you had to understand the, the latest literature. So he had been to Germany a couple of times before, just briefly, but this time he was going to stay for a year, and one desire he had was to really learn German well, to be able to speak fluently uh, with Germans in their own language and to read their literature on a good level. He thought about going to Berlin, where you had so many schools and scholars, but he didn't want to go there because he said in Berlin a lot of people spoke English. Well, his mindset, I think, was totally backwards. As far as I'm concerned, I'd hate to go somewhere where nobody spoke English, but uh, his desire was to be totally immersed in the language, and he could do that better in a smaller 
city, he felt. And there were many excellent universities in the smaller cities of Germany to choose from. It ended up that uh, he didn't want to study under some very famous conservative Bible-believing scholars, and especially Theodore Zahn, who was a very famous New Testament scholar, wrote a very massive and uh, elegant three-volume New Testament introduction, which is still in print. But uh, Machen thought, well, I can learn conservative stuff at Princeton. He says, I want to see what the forefront is of the whole subject, of the whole field of New Testament research. And that included, of course, the more liberal views. So he wanted to go somewhere where the foremost scholars were teaching. He ended up starting at, at the city of Marburg, in more toward the southern part of Germany. He studied under several professors there. Uh, Adolf Ulicker, perhaps, was the most famous at the time. Uh, Johannes Weiss uh, was also a very famous scholar teaching there. He was a more conservative teacher, uh, which was nice, sort of a relief from the others. He studied under a professor named Walter Bauer. Now, uh, in our beginning Greek class here at Western Reformed, we have just started translating 1 John. We just cracked the book a little bit ago, and now uh, every student had to get a big lexicon in their New Testament. So you have a Greek New Testament, and you got this huge lexicon. Uh, I think it weighs five pounds or so, and uh, every class, Brother Harvey picks up three of them out of the library and brings them into the classroom so we can look at things in class, and uh, then puts it back so thank you, Harvey, for doing that. And, uh, but the first name, Walter Bauer. Uh, Bauer, Donker, Art, Gingrich. Now, Walter Bauer is the professor that Machen studied under there in Marburg. And uh, it's a little interesting story about him told by his student, Ned Stonehouse. He says, uh, Bauer's lectures on John's gospel were followed faithfully. Bauer lectured at 8 a.m., on four days a week. And due to his youth and the unattractiveness of the hour, the enrollment was limited to two Germans, one Englishman, and Machen. On November the 12th, Machen reported that, quote, and this is a quotation from his letter home, the two Germans are irregular in their attendance. And on several occasions, the lecture has been begun for the benefit of my unworthy self alone. <laughs> Later, he noted that he actually uh, missed a class himself. Uh, having been in that situation as a teacher, I know that when you have just a few students and most of them miss, you're kind of disappointed. You wish all of them would miss. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess there's nothing new uh, with uh, Mr. Bauer. But he was especially impressed by another professor who taught theology there at Marburg named Wilhelm Hermann. Hermann was a classic liberal theologian of the era, but he was a very dynamic and pious individual, and Machen was rather shaken in his beliefs and in his faith to some extent when he sat under Hermann especially studied under him and observed him. He wrote several letters to his family during these years or during those weeks when he first met Hermann. And uh, this is what he said to his mother. The most important thing that has happened in, those, in my three days since Sunday was my first lecture from Professor Hermann. If my first impression is any guide, I should say that the first time I heard Hermann may almost be described as an epoch in my life. Such an overpowering personality, I think, I almost never before encountered. Overpowering in the sincerity of religious devotion. Hermann may be illogical and one-sided, but I tell you, he is alive. And then he wrote to his father a few days later, I can't criticize him, as my chief feeling with reference to him is already one of the deepest reverence. Since I have been listening to him, my other studies have for a time lost interest for me. 
For Hermann refuses to allow the student to look at religion from a distance as a thing to be studied merely. He speaks right to the heart, and I have been thrown all into confusion by what he says. So much deeper is his devotion to Christ than anything I have known in myself during the past few years. I don't know at all what yet to say, for Hermann's views are so revolutionary, but certain I am that he has found Christ, and I believe that he can show how others may find him. Though perhaps afterwards in details, he may not be a safe guide. In fact, I am rather sorry I have said even so much in a letter, for I don't know at all yet what to think. This uh, questioning and this variation, uh, meeting someone like Hermann, almost overthrew him, you might say, at an emotional level. And this continued for several weeks. But gradually, as, as he noted here, he began to realize that the Christ which Hermann was worshiping and to, which he was so, to whom he was so dedicated was not the same as the Christ of the Bible. And as uh, Machen further developed in his own thinking and understanding, and as he studied the scripture more and more, it became clear to him that in spite of this wonderful attraction of Hermann's theology and his personality, that it still was another religion. Well, that was one term he spent at Marburg, and he felt he'd like to try a different university for the second term for that year. And so he traveled farther north to the University of Göttingen. And there he studied under several other famous professors. Emil Schur, perhaps is known to some of you as the author of uh, The History of the Jewish People in the Time of Jesus Christ, a massive five-volume work. Uh, Wilhelm Hert Müller, another very careful scholar. And then Wilhelm Busset, who was a younger and a brilliant scholar and had a great impact on many people of his time. I brought with me one of my books uh, written by Bousset. This is his book. It's just titled Jesus. It was published in 1906, the very same year that Machen studied under him in uh, Gerdigen in Germany. I found that if you, if, if you wave a, a book like this around, it shows that you are a scholar and you know what you're talking about. <laughs> <clears throat> As, uh, as Machen studied in these schools, <laughs> while he had these doubts and revelations, you might say, he still kept a steady course in his faith, and he says that whenever these doubts would arise, he would especially be blessed by going to the Gospel of Luke and reading again the Gospel of Luke. And for him, that was like an anchor in his life, and it brought him back to the gospel, to Christ, as he really, really is. These experiences, I think, did a couple of things for Machen. One thing, they gave him a better sympathy and understanding of the liberals and of their appeal and of their theology and the success that liberalism had in the churches. He mentions that in America, the liberal churches were often cold and and yet here in Germany, it was so warm and, and throbbing with life. And that seemed to be a, sort of a source of power that gave more impetus to the liberal movement throughout even the United States. It also, I believe, showed him the great danger of liberalism. The, how that, as a Christian, we must be aware of their arguments and why they don't hold up and how they don't show that Jesus is someone else, another savior, and that our Bible is not really accurate in what it says about him. Well, during these years, he continued to have questions about what he would do. Would he go back and teach the seminary? He was reluctant to do that. So his uh, mentor there at uh, Princeton Seminary, uh, Professor Armstrong, said, well, why don't you just come back and teach for one year, uh, like an instructor? 
not, not a regular faculty member. Just come back and, and teach for one year. And uh, Mason said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And it ended up he taught there for 22 years. Uh, and that's sometimes how things, how things work. Short-term missionary becomes a long-term missionary very often. Finally, as uh, after he had taught for about um, eight years or so at Princeton, by that time he had become more convinced by his studies and, and uh, careful examination of all these different arguments that the Bible truly is God's infallible word and that Jesus Christ is who, who the Bible says he is and he had full confidence in the doctrines of Scripture and he agreed then that he was ready to take his vows as a Presbyterian minister and to be ordained as a minister in the church and also then to become a regular member of the faculty at Princeton. And that happened in that year, 1914. During these years, he began to produce uh, many wonderful articles as well as his teaching and his uh, other studies. Uh, he wrote an article called Jesus and Paul, another one called History and Faith. And these articles were published in various uh, books at the time, and they've been published ever since. I wanted to just uh, mention this book. Uh, J. Gresham Machen uh, selected shorter works, which is very interesting, and it has a wide variety of articles that Machen wrote on a number of subjects. And the article on uh, history and faith is included in this volume. <clears throat> A major book that his first major book that he produced was The Origin of Paul's Religion. And uh, so I'm going to wave that book around too. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, have, I have some things in common with Brother uh, Tito Lero. Uh, one is that both of us plowed through this book just recently in preparation uh, for these lectures. And uh, it is uh, it's, it's a read. Is that the right thing to say? It has a lot of footnotes, it has a lot of detail, it has, but it's very well organized, and its argument is very close, uh, but he doesn't give you the headings, it's just all paragraphs. So you have to sort of figure out the outline as you go along. And some students have actually done that and published outlines of these books. But this book, The Origin of Paul's Religion, deals with the question, how did Paul get to be a Christian with the beliefs that he had. And the main, one of the main beliefs is that Jesus is divine. He's the Son of God. He is God. And we worship him. He's the object of our faith. How did Paul get this idea? And uh, so he goes into all the different uh, arguments that the liberals give because the liberals don't think Jesus was a divine person, that he wasn't the Son of God. He didn't claim these things for himself. So where do these ideas come from, and how did Paul get them? And so this book analyzes all the different possible ways that that might have been done, and they all are found wanting by uh, very conclusive arguments. Two other important books that he produced in the year which we are now studying, right? 1923, 100 years ago. New Testament Greek for Beginners. And all, uh, yeah. <laughs> that book was actually written the same time as this book that we're studying, Christianity and Liberalism. So I was wondering which of those two books actually has had the greatest influence through the last 100 years. And it's an interesting question, because th I would say thousands of ministers have learned the Greek New Testament, the Greek language for the New Testament, using Machen's textbook. It's still in print, and uh, that's been a great impact. On the other hand, this book also has had a great impact through the years, and it's still in print. Well, I looked on Amazon, that's where you find out all these things, and... As far as the current status of those two books, you know, you read about this book is number 10 on Amazon or number 15, you know. Well, New Testament Greek for Beginners is number 400,000. <laughs> or excuse me, 500,000. 500,000. And Christianity and Liberalism is 400,000. So both of them are kind of down the list a little ways. 
But uh, this book sells a little bit more than the Greek grammar does. But they're both still being sold, but they both have a tremendous influence because they have influenced so many people through all these years that have carried on then from their witness. The heart of the controversy, basically, is that it relates Christ and the Bible. And that is that Christianity says that Christ is the divine Son of God, and the Bible is primarily a record of what he has done. It's not primarily a moral code or a book of history of other things. But God has given to us his word to show us, to tell us what he has done through Christ. And uh, in our Westminster Confession, it says that the word of God was given by God, uh, revelation, divine revelation was given by God in the form of covenant. And as God has revealed to us anything in Scripture, the purpose is to show how we are related and can be related to God through Jesus Christ. And it primarily records the event of Christ coming, dying for our sins, being raised again. The Old Testament looks forward to that. The New Testament describes it and explains it. And this is the heart of the message of the Bible. And those two things cannot be separated. Now, the old liberals thought that Jesus was a wonderful teacher and a great moral instructor a great example. He was the first and the greatest Christian. And all Christians after look to Jesus as our inspiration, as our example. And as he gave his life fully believing in God as his father, so we can give our lives fully believing that God is our father and the father of all people. And that idea, as as, uh, was emphasized last night, of the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood, of man, that idea was permeated all of this liberal theology. And Machen's point was that Jesus is much more than an example. He is much more than a teacher. He is the savior. Almost, well, I I think we can say every other religion has an idea that if you are going to attain the ultimate happiness, whatever that might be in that religion. Heaven, unification with the universe, whatever it is, nirvana, whatever the the goal is, that there is a pathway to attain this goal. I like to think of it like you look in the sky and it's just a nice clear blue sky and then a great religious teacher comes and as you look at the sky, as you listen to that teaching and then you understand you see appearing gradually like a network of golden ropes that kind of climb up into the sky. And now all you have to do is climb up this net in the sky and you'll achieve that. And if you fail, you'll go somewhere else maybe and then you have another chance. You go up again. And this repeats itself as often as necessary, but you, you have the way and, and these great religious teachers are leading you to God. And, of course, God is not defined especially carefully, but it's that ultimate good. You are led to this by just climbing up that ladder and and following this direction, this inspired direction. And they thought of Jesus as someone like that. And Machen said, no, it's not like that at all. Christianity is not a religion where we climb up to God. But rather, God has come down to us to save us. He has come and grabbed onto us, and he brings us to himself. And it's not our work, it's his work. And that's what Christianity is all about. We are saved by grace, not through our works. We are brought to God by Christ who gave himself, and he paid the price. He obtained our salvation. He fulfilled the terms of that great covenant that makes us God's children. So Machen often said, I think maybe a hundred times said it, Jesus is not an example of faith. Jesus is the object of faith. 
we believe in him. All these old liberals try to say, well, the Bible teaches that Jesus was like we think because, after all, the book of John, where it says Jesus is God so many times, well, that book was written much later and that doesn't count. It wasn't written by the apostle. It was written by somebody else later on, somebody that never actually knew Jesus. And then Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, well, you know, it says, you know, an apostle of Christ, a wit- eyewitness of Christ. That's not true either. Uh, Matthew didn't write that. Uh, Luke, he never knew Jesus in the first place. The only one left is Mark. And they like Mark the best because it's short. And uh, it's like students, you know, you give them four books to read, they'll read the shortest one. But uh, Mark doesn't have as many miracles in it as the other Gospels. So Mark's the best. And we can figure out that Mark was the first gospel and that the other gospels were written by copying parts of Mark and other things. So that theory was developed of Mark and priority. And, of course, we don't know exactly which gospel was written first. It doesn't really, for us, it doesn't matter a whole lot which one was written first. But their belief was, well, Mark was written first, and all these other things were added on to Mark later in the other gospels. So all we have to do is go back to Mark. So Machen writes about this quite a bit, and he says, okay, let's go to Mark. What does Jesus say in Mark? The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to do what? To give his life a ransom for many. That doesn't sound like liberalism very much. Uh, Well, uh, you look in the Gospel of Mark, what what happens to unbelievers? Uh, They go to hell. Who does Jesus say he is? He says he's the Messiah. He says that uh, you have to do what he says or you go to hell. He says he has no sin, but you all do. And uh, the, the deity and the, the God, God, I guess you could say, the fact that Jesus is divine is so interwoven into the very fabric, even of the Gospel of Mark, that if you pull all those things out of there, you don't have anything left. It doesn't make sense. And so the radical theologians came in. And when Machen was in Germany, these radical theologians were recognizing the weaknesses of the liberal position, and they were trying to figure out some other way where you could figure out how the Gospels got there, how Paul got the way he was, but not the old liberal ideas. So uh, these were the radicals, and Bousset, that blue book there, that first one, he was one of those radicals. Uh, There were many others that were current in the days when Machen studied in Germany. In the, uh, have any of you heard of Albert Schweitzer? I remember years ago I used to assign Albert Schweitzer's book in one of my classes. I think Jim Blizzard had to read that book and he didn't like it. I remember. (laughs) Jim will be happy to know that we don't require that book to be read anymore. Instead, we read a a harmony of the Gospels, which is much more edifying uh, and useful. But Albert Schweitzer was a famous missionary and scholar and organist. And he went all over uh, Europe playing organ concerts, raising money for his African mission, and extremely famous, kind of like Mother Teresa. Everybody knew Albert Schweitzer. But then he wrote this book on the quest for the historical Jesus. And he went through all these different theories and how they couldn't stand up and how later critics criticized the earlier ones and and nothing seemed to work. In, uh, In his own view, Jesus was an apocalyptic preacher. He thought the end of the world was coming and that he himself was going to be installed as a messianic king. Not that he was God, but that he, God was going to make him into this great king of the last days. And, uh, and so he died thinking that was going to happen, but it didn't. And so he was tragically mistaken. And he says, Jesus' mangled body is still turning on the wheel of history. And uh, that's how he ends his book. That was in 1905. Uh, Just a few years before that, Wilhelm Vreda said, well, you know, the Gospel of Mark, you look at it more carefully, and it's not just a single Gospel. It's got all sorts of things behind it. We don't really know how the Gospel of Mark got that way. And so we can't really trust it either. So these radical theologians were just tearing down whatever the liberals had left in the days of Machen. Because you really can't make sense of the Bible if Jesus is not who he says he is. A lot of the arguments regarding Paul 
were also going on in these days. And of course, Meachin had written his book on the origin of Paul's religion. And as you go through that book, you see that there are many arguments they used. Well, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks had their gods. And some of those gods went into Hades and died. And then they came back again. And then you had Horus and other gods who did that. And then in the days before Christ, you had the Hellenistic mystery religions where they had all these strange uh, doctrines and people dying and coming back again. And Paul must have heard those things and somehow he got these ideas mixed up with Jesus. And then they said, well, maybe it was that the Jews where Paul lived as a boy up in Tarsus, they were liberal Jews. And they didn't think you had to keep the law. And that's where Paul got the idea he didn't have to keep the law. Well, that didn't seem to fit at all with what data we have in Scripture. Uh, Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees and very strict on the law. And they thought, well, maybe it was the, the disciples in, in Antioch when Paul was there, or in Damascus when he was first converted. Maybe they gave him these ideas. And uh, no, that, that didn't work either because their ideas were the very same as the ideas of the disciples in Jerusalem. So well, maybe the disciples in Jerusalem got their ideas after Jesus was dead and, and they just changed everything. And uh, so Machen demonstrates, well, that doesn't work either. If, if Jesus said he was to be, the, God was going to institute his messianic kingdom and we simply bear witness to that kingdom, well, when Jesus died, that doesn't stop the program. The program will continue. The kingdom will be established. Praise God. Even though Jesus is dead, God will keep working. But that's not what they thought. They thought the whole thing was, was destroyed. The whole faith was destroyed. So all these arguments, Machen very carefully discusses, evaluates, and shows that they cannot prove the idea that Jesus was anything else but then what he really was, the Son of God. That's the only thing that makes sense, that Jesus truly was a divine person, the Son of God, and that he did teach that he was so. And his disciples in Jerusalem believed that. And after his resurrection, they truly believed that he was raised from the dead. So when Paul was called by Jesus on the road to Damascus, he said, I got my commission from Jesus himself. And I was converted to Christ when I saw him on that road. When he first met those early disciples, he already knew who he was. He knew what he believed. They were able to tell him, fill him in, you might say, on the details of the history of Jesus, his life and his sayings and that sort of thing. He met with Peter. He met with James. He met with uh, Ananias and other early disciples, and so he said, the things that I received, I'm passing on to you. So he did have that connection with them. So this was Machen's main contribution to the subject of the Bible and the subject of Christ. He showed without doubt that the religion of Paul is the same as the religion of those early disciples. You know, the liberals, they didn't like all of Paul's epistles. They said, well, Paul wrote just a few of those epistles. He didn't write them all. And they liked Galatians, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. They said, okay, we'll give you those. So what does Machen do? He says, okay, I'll take them. Give me those. And he just used those epistles, basically, to prove all these points. Especially Galatians. In Galatians chapter 1, it talks about how... how uh, Paul first had contact with these disciples and how Christ called him. In chapter 2, he says, When I first met those disciples, then later they gave us the right hand of fellowship. They agreed with my gospel. I agreed with their gospel. And later on in chapter 2, he says, Peter and I, when we talked about justification by faith alone, we agreed on that. That was our common teaching, our common doctrine. Our faith is one. You know, it's interesting, in the year 2014, oh, here we go, got to wave some more books around, just to confirm what I said, here we go. In the year 2014, just rec fairly recently, this book was published, written by Bart Ehrman, How Jesus Became God. Bart Ehrman was a professor of New Testament and, and Greek at Princeton Seminary. And now he's in a secondary university, but uh, 
He was a strong evangelical Christian as a young man, went to school, became a liberal, went to school some more and became an atheist. Although he, he doesn't say atheist, he says agnostic. But he says, makes it very clear, I'm, no, I'm not a Christian. I don't believe I'm, I'm, I'm not a Christian anymore. He makes that very clear in this book. You know, Machen would have respected that. Machen said he hated it when these liberals were preaching in a church and said they were a Christian and then they deny the doctrines. At least Ehrman's honest enough. He says, well, I don't believe the doctrines, therefore I'm not a Christian. And uh, well, give him credit for that. But uh, you read the outline of this book. You have the Greek gods. You've got the Greek mystery religions. You've got Paul unlike the Jerusalem disciples. You, got Paul. you have the very same arguments, exactly the same list of arguments that Machen had 100 years ago. The same thing. It's like this never was written. Of course, Machen's not found anywhere in, in his uh, index. But uh, that's still going on. And this book, New York Times bestseller, it says right up there. And, uh, not 400,000, but right up there near the top. So this is still being taught all the more today, the very same things that Machen was teaching. I'm very glad that the same year that this book came out, this one also did, looks kind of similar, it's called How God Became Jesus. And this was written by five good evangelical scholars uh, answering the arguments in Ehrman's book. So I'm glad they did that. And uh, these are, are very fine responses to Ehrman's, uh, I think, rather shoddy arguments in, in many places. Well, may God encourage us to have total faith that Jesus is who he claims to be, the Son of God. And the best scholarship in the world has not shaken that truth. But in the tradition of Machen and, and uh, the believers in Christ all through the centuries, we can be confident in our faith in God's word and in his son. So let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the wonderful way that you have preserved your truth through the centuries and raised up people to give themselves to study and to uh, diligent labor in order to answer the attacks made upon the scriptures. And we pray you would bless us as we read the Bible, as we pray to the Lord, as we believe in Christ, that we would have all confidence that these things are true indeed. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I wave a book while I'm making an announcement. That way everybody thinks I'm a scholar. As a, no. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Battle. A blessing. Uh, we're going to take a 10-minute break. There are refreshments to the right. There's a literature table to the left with information about the seminary. I also wanted to just say that our next year's lecture series is the same weekend, but Friday and Saturday. And Jonathan Gibson will be the speaker. Jonathan Gibson is an Old Testament scholar. He's going to be talking about Genesis 1 and 2. He is, uh, has uh, published several books, including a devotional called Be Thou My Vision, a children's book called uh, The Moon is Always Round, uh, uh, selected works of Thomas Witherow. He's an editor of that and a very good speaker. And he's Irish, so the accent really always uh, helps as well there. So put it in your calendar. Whatever, you know, so be it what, the, uh, today's the, third, the 14th, so the 13th and 14th, or 14th, 15th next year, Friday and Saturday, uh, Lord willing. So 10 minutes, and we'll be back for our last lecture. Thank you.